Good afternoon. It's five o'clock on the news. Hey. Um, for those of you who uh, were here on Thursday night, um, I promised the bench scene from Carousel and then a discussion of it afterwards. Here we are. I, I'm good on my promises. Um, I should point out that there's a bench here, and in a fully staged production, it would be used in a different way than we're using it today. Um, because they're going to be at music stands, you have to conceive of the notion of it being the bench scene. So here, I'm proud to present the bench scene from Carousel. Come on, Julie. It's getting late. Julie! That's right. Don't you pay her no mind. Look, she's coming round at you again. Let's run! I ain't scared of her. And I got one more thing to say to you, young woman. You so much as poke your nose in my carousel again, I'm gonna have you thrown out. Right on your little pink behind. You got no call to talk to her like that. She ain't doing you no harm. Oh, ain't she? Huh. I want to get in trouble with the police and lose my license? What is the woman talking about? Letting my barker fool with you. Ooh, ain't you shamed. Oh, I don't let no man he fool with me. He leaned against her all through the ride. He leaned against the horse, but he didn't lay a hand on me. Oh, no, Miss Innocence, and he didn't put his arm around your waist, neither. And suppose he did. Is that reason to have a cataleptic fit? You keep out of this, you rip. Now, I have given you your warning. You come back, you'll get thrown out. Who will throw me out? Billy Bigelow, the Barker. Same fellow you let fool with you. I, I bet he wouldn't. He wouldn't <laughs> throw me out. I bet the same thing. You mind your business, hussy. Go back to your carousel and leave oh, us alone. Yes, leave us alone, you yo. Are, yo. You know, I don't run my business for a lot of chippies. Chippy yourself. Yes, chippy yourself. Shut yes. up. Chippy. Shut up. Jabber, 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 jabber. What's going on anyway? Spitting and sputtering like three lumps of corn popping on a shovel. Mr. Bigelow, please. Don't yell! I didn't yell. Well, don't. What's the matter? Take a look at that girl, Billy. She ain't ever allowed on my carousel again. And next time she tries to get in, if she dares, I want you to throw her out. You hear me? Throw her out! All right. You heard what the lady said. Run home now. Come on, Julie. No, I won't. Like a drain. Sure. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Bigelow, tell me, please, honest and truly, if I came to the carousel again, would you throw me out? What did she do, anyway? She I says you put your arm around my waist. Oh, <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> Here's something new. Can't put my arm around a girl without I ask your permission that how it is. I, I just don't want that one around no more. <laughs> You come around all you want, you hear? And if you ain't got the price, Billy Bigelow will treat you to a ride. Oh, big talker, ain't you, Mr. Bigelow? I suppose you think I can't throw you out, too, if I want. Yeah, you're such a good barker, I can't get along without you. Is that it? Well, just for that, you're discharged. Uh-huh. Your services are no longer required. You're bounced, see? Very well, Mrs. Mullen. You know, I could bounce you if I felt like it. And you felt like it just now, so I'm bounced. What? You have to pick up on every word I say? But gee, I only said that. my that services are no longer required. Very good. We'll let it go with that, Mrs. Mullen. All right, you devil. We will let it go at that. Well, Mr. Bigelow, if she's willing to say she'll change her you mind. You keep out of it. Well, I, I don't want this to happen on account of me. Apologize to her. Oh. <gasps> Me? Apologize to her? For what? For spoiling the good name of my carousel? The business that was left to me by my dear saintly departed husband, <sighs> Mr. Mullet? <laughs> I only wish my husband were alive at this moment. I bet he don't. He would smack you in the jaw. That's just what I'm gonna do with you if you don't dry up. Oh, you upstart! After all I have done for you, I'm through with you for good, you hear me? Yeah. Through for good, and I won't take you back like before. Don't get sorry for me, or I'll give you a slap on the jaw. Don't you feel sorry for me either. I don't feel sorry for you, Mr. Bigelow. <laughs> You're a liar. 
You are feeling sorry for me. I can see it in your face. You think now that she fired me, I can't get another job. <laughs> what will you do now, Mr. Biglow? <laughs> well, first of all, I'll go and get... Go and get myself a glass of beer. <laughs> Whenever anything bothers me, I always drink a glass of beer. So you are bothered about losing your job? No. No. Only about how I'm going to pay for the beer. <laughs> will you pay for it? Will you? How much money you got? 43 cents. And you? I asked you how much money you got. I understand. But you needn't cry about it. Listen, I'm going to the carousel to get my things. Stay here till I come back, and then we'll go have a drink. It's all right. Keep your money. I'll pay. Julie. Julie. Do you like him? I don't know. Well, did you like it when he talked to you today? But he put you on the carousel that way. Did you like that? I'd rather not say. You're a queer one, Julie Jordan. You are quieter and deeper than a well. Can you never tell me nothing? There's nothing that I care to choose to tell. You've been acting. When we work in the mill, weaving at the loom, you gaze absent-minded at the roof. And half the time your shuttle gets twisted in the threads, so you can't tell the warp from the woof. It ain't so. You're a queer one, Julie Jordan. You won't ever tell a body what you think. You're as tight-lipped as an oyster And as silent as an old Sahara spink Spinks. Huh? Spinks. Uh-huh, spink. You spell it with an X. That's only when there's more than one. Oh. Julie, I've been busting to tell you something lately. You have? The reason I didn't care to tell you before was because you didn't have a fella of your own. But now that you got one, I can tell you about mine. <laughs> I'm glad you got a fella, Carrie. What's his name? His name is Mr. Snow, and an upstanding man is he. He comes home every night in his round bottom boat with a net full of heron from the sea. An almost perfect bow, as refined as a girl could wish. But he spends so much time in his round bottom boat that he can't seem to lose the smell of fish. <laughs> the first time he kissed me, the whiff of his clothes knocked me flat on the floor of the room. But now that I love him, my heart in my nose and fish is my favorite perfume last night he spoke quite low and a fair spoken man is he and he said miss pipperidge i'd like it fine if i could be wed with a wife and indeed miss pipperidge if you'll be I'll be yours for the rest of my life. Next moment we were promised, <laughs> and now my mind's in a maze. For all I can do is look forward to that wonderful day of days. Where Snow. The flowers.
snow, here I am. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. So you see, I can understand now how you feel about Billy Bigelow. He's still here. You told us to wait for you. What do you think I want with two of you? I meant that one of you was to wait. The other can go home. All right. All right. If one of you goes home, where do you work? Bascom's Cotton Mill, a little ways up the river. And you? I work there, too. Well, one of you goes home. Which of you wants to stay? Come on, speak up. Which of you stays? Whoever stays loses her job. How do you mean? All Bascom's girls have to be respectable. We all have to live in the Mill Borden house. And if we're late, they lock us out, and we can't go back to work there anymore. Is that true? <laughs> Will he bounce you if you're not home on time? That's Ooh. right. <laughs> Julie, should I go? <clears throat> I, I can't tell you what to do. All right. I'll stay if you like. Is that right? You'll be discharged if you stay. Julie, should I go? Why do you keep asking me that? You know what's best to do. All right, Carrie, you can go home. Well, good night. Well, now, we're both out of a job. <laughs> you had your supper. No. You want to eat out on the pier? No. Anywhere else? No. <laughs> you, you don't come to the carousel much. Only seen you uh, three times before today. I've been there much more than that. All yeah, right. Did you see me? Yes. And uh, did you know I was Billy Bigelow? They told me. <laughs> Have you got a sweetheart? No. Ah, don't lie to me. I haven't anybody. You stayed here with me the first time I asked you. You know your way around, all right, all right. No, I don't, Mr. Bigelow. Uh, and I suppose you don't know why you're sitting here like this, alone, with me. You wouldn't have stayed so quick if you hadn't have done this before. Uh, what did you stay for, anyway? So you wouldn't be left alone. Alone? <laughs> God, you're dumb. <laughs> I don't need to be alone. I can have all the girls I want. Don't you know that? I know, Mr. Bigelow. <laughs> what do you know? That all the girls are crazy for you. But that's not why I stayed. I stayed because you've been so good to me. Well, then you can go home. I don't want to go home now. And suppose I go away and leave you sitting here. Even then, I wouldn't go home. Do you know what you remind me of? <laughs> a girl I knew in Coney Island. I I'll tell you how I met her. One night at closing time, we'd put the lights out on the carousel, and just as I was walking out, there was this... Good evening, Tiffany. Good night. <clears throat> evening, uh, Mr. Bascom. That's 
girl is one of your girls. One of my girls? Is that you, Miss Jordan? Yes, Mr. Bascom. Well, whatever are you doing at this hour? Uh, I... You know, you know what time we close the doors at the mill, boarding mill. You couldn't be home by now if you ran home. No, sir. Those old sideburns. Hey, now, don't you go calling Mr. Bascom names unless you're fixing to get yourself into trouble. We got a report on this fellow from the police chief up in Bangor. He's a pretty sly gazebo, came up from Coney Island. <laughs> New York, eh? Works on the carousels there, makes specialty of these young things like this, gets them all moony-eyed, promises to marry them, and then takes their money. I haven't got any money. Speak when you're spoken to. Julie, you heard what kind of blackguard this man is. <laughs> you're inexperienced girl, and he's imposed on you and deluded you. That's why I'm inclined to give you a second chance. You hear that? I'm, I'm meeting Mrs. Bascom at the chapel. We're going to, I'm going to drive you home, and I'll explain everything to the house matron. Well, Come, girl, my child. Don't be sitting there like you didn't have good sense. Do I have to go with you? Well, no, you don't have to go. Then I'll stay. After I warned you. You see, Timony, there's some of them you just can't help. Good night. Good night, Mr. Bascom. You, you low-down scalawag, ought to throw you in jail. What for? Don't know. I wish I did. <laughs> well, and then what? Huh? You were starting to tell me a story? Me? <laughs> About that girl in Coney Island, you said you just put out the lights in the carousel. That's as far as you got. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> just as the lights went out, uh, someone came along, a little girl with a shawl, you know. The... <laughs> Say, tell me something. Ain't you scared of me? I mean, after what that cop said about me taking money from girls? I ain't scared. That's your name, Julie, Julie something? Julie Jordan. You're a queer one, Julie Jordan. Ain't you sorry that you didn't run away? You can still go if you wanna. I reckon that I care to choose to stay. You couldn't take my money if I didn't have any And I don't have a penny, it's true And if I did have money, you couldn't take any Cause you'd ask and I'd give it to you You're a queer one, Julie Jordan Ain't you ever had a fella you give money to? No Ain't you ever had a fella at all? No Well, you must have had a fella you went walking with Yes Where'd you walk? Nowhere special, I recall. In the woods? No. On the beach? No. Did you love him? No. I never <laughs> loved no one. I told you that. <sighs> Say, <laughs> you are a funny kid. You want to go to town and dance, maybe, or? No. I have to be careful. Of what? Of my character. You see, I'm never going to marry. I'm never going to marry. If I was going to marry, I wouldn't have to be such a stickler. But I'm never going to marry. And a girl who don't marry has got to be much more particular. Well, uh, suppose I was to say that uh, I'd marry you. You. <laughs> now you're scared, aren't you? You're thinking about what that cop said. No, I ain't. I never paid no mind to what he said. But you wouldn't marry anyone like me, would you? Yes, I would. If I loved you, it wouldn't make no difference what you... <sighs> Even if I died for it. How do you know what you'd do if you loved me? <laughs> or how you'd feel or, or anything? I don't know how I know. Well, just the same, I know how I, how would it be if I loved you? 
When I worked in the mill, weaving at the loom, I'd gaze absent-minded at the roof. And half the time the shuttle'd get tangled in the threads, and the warp would get mixed with the woof. If I loved you. But you don't. No, I don't. But somehow I can see just exactly how I'd be if I loved you. Time and again I would try to say all I'd want you. Don't love me. That's what you said. Yes. I can smell them. Can you? The blossoms. The wind brings them down. Much wind tonight. Hardly any. You can't hear a sound, not the turn of a leaf, nor the fall of a wave hidden the sand. The tide's creeping up on the sand like a beach. Afraid to be caught stealing the land On a night like this I start to wonder What life is all about And I always say two heads are better than one To figure it out <laughs> I, I don't need you <laughs> or anybody to help me. I got it figured out. We ain't important. What are we, a couple of specks of nothing? Look up there. There's a hell of a lot of stars in the sky. And the sky's so big, the sea looks small and too. At all. You, you're a funny kid. I don't remember ever, ever meeting a girl like you. Uh, you know, 
You, are you trying to get me to marry you? No. Lindy, what's putting it into my head? You're different, all right. I don't know what it is. You look up at me with that little kid face like you... like you trusted me. I wonder what it'd be like. What? Nothing. <clears throat> I know what it'd be like. It'd be awful. <laughs> I can just see myself. Kind of scrawny and pale, picking at my food, and lovesick like any other guy. I'd throw away my sweater and dress up like a dude in a dicky and a collar and a tie. If I loved you. But you don't. No, I don't. But somehow I can see just exactly how I'd be. If I loved you time and again, I would try to say all I'd want you to know If I loved you Words wouldn't come in an easy way Round in circles I'd go Afraid and shy, I let my golden chances pass me by. Soon you'd leave me, off you would go in the mist of day. Never. I'm, I'm not a fella to marry anybody. Even if I was, even if a girl was foolish enough to want me to, I, I wouldn't. Don't worry about it, Billy. Who's worried? You were right about there being no wind. The blossoms are just falling down by themselves. Just their time too, I reckon. done with them yet, but I wanted to acknowledge each one of them. Jen Gambatiz, yeah. Leah Horowitz, oh, oh. Nate Hackman, yeah. Jen Reagan, 
Jack Vertel, <laughs> Richard Malty Jr., and our orchestra, Greg Jarrett. Yes. Now, as promised, um, Jack Vertel is in the process of writing a book called The Secret Life of the American Musical, and it was actually his notion that we should do this. And I'm now going to turn it over to him, because the idea is that now we'll, we'll give a little bit of a sense of what you just saw and, and why it's extraordinary and how it works. So, Jack, over to you. Thank you. I, I don't know if any of you could tell, but the last time I acted, it was also on a high school stage. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in high school. Um, <laughs> Back in the 1970s, when I was a struggling screenwriter, uh, a collaborator and I got hired to write a werewolf movie. And it was supposed to be directed, though it never actually got made, of course, by the great cinematographer Michael Chapman. And like most werewolf movies, it featured a love story at the center. <clears throat> and when we turned in our first draft, Chapman came at us with a barrage of notes, one of which was about the first meeting between the young woman and the older man who would, in the course of the story, fall in love. This is awful, he said, although he may have used a stronger word than awful. If you want to know how to write the first encounter between two future mates, there's a book that'll tell you everything you need to know. This was intriguing. These scenes are damned hard to write. And what was this secret book, the key that would unlock one of the mysteries of screenwriting? It's called The Courtship Habits of the Great Crested Grebe, he said. We were unsurprisingly deflated by this news. <laughs> a dryly written ornithological monogram was hardly what we had hoped for, but it was only 80 pages long. So we bought it and we read it, still in print, incidentally. Uh, and it told us everything we needed to know. The Great Crested Grebe is a lake bird. And all I really remember about the book today is that it detailed painstakingly the odd ritual of courtship that the male and the female go through, which is baffling to the human eye, but hard not to watch if you're lucky enough to get the chance. Ungainly birds approaching each other on water, flapping their wings aggressively, retreating from each other, pecking at each other's necks, retreating again, shaking their bodies in something that looks a little like a dance and a little like a fit, and then, for no discernible reason, building a nest together. No one knows why they do it that way, but it's a metaphor. as a metaphor, it's a study in fear and desire. And humans do it just like the great crested grebe, awkwardly, with a lot of insecure wasted motion, overaggression followed by apology, sufficient preening, sufficient modesty, bravery and cowardice, hope and hurt feelings, they play out in a tug of war with a big dose of uncertainty about the outcome. It's the invaluable, it's the inevitable upshot of seeing someone that you want. And it's almost always compelling to watch. As the stage manager in our town says right before he serves a strawberry phosphate to the teenagers, Emily and George, I'm awfully interested in how these things get started. In a musical, this moment is called generically a conditional love song. It's called that because of Rodgers and Hammerstein's If I Loved You, which is the song embedded in what people in the business keep referring to as the bench scene, act one, scene two of Carousel, arguably the most perfect scene ever written in a musical, in part because it so beautifully imitates, completely unwittingly, I'm sure, the courtship habits of the great crested grebe. So <laughs> what we're going to do now is to do parts, at least, of the scene again, but this time with annoying cuts and interruptions. Uh, these wonderful performers are going to have to try to hold concentration while we yak at you from time to time, trying to break the code of the scene and help you understand why Rodgers and Hammerstein did what they did and how they did it. Yeah, Richard? I'm, I'm Richard Mulvey. I, 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 I'm nominally the director of this, although I can't say I can take any credit for these brilliant performances. Weren't they spectacular? I, <laughs> But I, I'm also a, a, a writer, and, and the absolutely fascinating thing which I, I would like to focus your attention on is uh, the structure of this brilliant scene. It, has, uh, it, it seems to go along following its action, but if you, if you uh, dissect it, you can understand how brilliantly the information that you need to know about the characters is revealed in the course of the action. This is, although there is a scene that precedes it at the carousel, the carousel waltz, this is the scene that introduces all the characters. And you have to know everything about them for the love story to take place, for the love scene to take place. So let's just sort of... Uh, uh, let's dip in where, where uh, we don't need to hear the initial argument again, which is a very, I'd like to say though, for future reference, an incredibly grounded, earth-like argument among you know, a bunch of people about the carousel. 
Uh, but let's start with uh, Mrs. Mullen saying, I don't run my business for a lot of chippies, and Hi. see where we get to. Okay. <laughs> this will be fun. They don't know where we're going to stop. <laughs> I don't run my business for a lot of chippies. Chippy yourself. Yeah, yeah you yourself. Shut up. Jabber, jabber, jabber. Jabber, 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 jabber. What's going on anyway? Spitting and sputtering like three lumps of corn, popping on a shovel. Mr. Bigelow, please. Don't yell. I didn't yell. Well, don't. What's the matter? Hmm. Take a look at that girl, Billy. She ain't ever allowed to be on my carousel again. And next time she tries to get in, if she dares, I want you to throw her out. Understand? Throw her out! All right. You heard what the lady said. Hmm. Run home now. Come on, June. No, I won't. Ah, no, I won't. The story's about her. It's not about her. <laughs> The main story is about the girl who says, no, I won't. And we immediately want to know, who is that girl that is standing up for herself in that way? Keep and the going. fascinating thing about the rest of the scene is she doesn't say very much at all. Until she sings, If I Loved You, she says almost nothing. We catch it. We figure it out from the small little clues that she says, mostly because she won't leave. Like a drink? Sure. Mr. Bigelow. Tell me, please, honest and truly, if I came to the carousel, would you throw me out? What did she do, anyway? He says you put your arm around my waist. Oh, so that's it. <laughs> Here's something new. Can't put my arm around a girl without I ask your permission. That's how it is. I, I just don't want that one around no more. You come around all you want, see? And if you ain't got the price, Billy Bigelow will treat you to a ride. Oh, big talker, ain't you, Mr. Bigelow? I suppose you think I can't throw you out if I want. You're such a good barker, I can't get along without you. That it? Well, just for that, you're discharged. Mm -hmm. Your surfaces are no longer required. You're bounced, see? Very well, Mrs. Mullen. You know, I could bounce you if I felt like it. And you felt like it just now, so I'm bounced. <laughs> Do you have to pick up on every word I say? No, I only just said that. my that services I... are no longer required. Very good. We'll let it go at that, Mrs. Mullen. All right, you devil. We'll let it go at that. Well, Mr. Bigelow, if she's willing to say she'll change her mind. You keep out of it. Well, I don't want this to happen on account of me. Apologize to her. Oh! <laughs> what? Me? Apologize to her? What for? For spoiling the good name of my carousel? The business that was left to be by my... Dear saintly departed husband, Mr. Mullen, oh, I wish my poor husband were alive this minute. I bet he don't. OK. Uh, now, that's just Hammerstein having some fun. And being, <laughs> okay. you know, we've got a comic character, and she has some comic to do. But he, he's, he's, he's just done something. When he says apologize to her, he's just done something for Julie that no one has probably ever done for her before. She's, a, she's basically a waif, as we will learn in a moment, working in a mill with no prospects whatsoever. And somebody just stood up for her for the first time. And that's kind of important, because later in the scene, she's going to do something for him that no one's ever done before. We, do we want to skip ahead here, or how would you like to do this? Uh, yeah, we can. Yeah, let's, um, ah. there you go. <laughs> you, can, you, can, uh, you can make. The, the point that about uh, uh, Mr. Snow, uh, which is really, it's a very beautiful melody, and it could, it could be a scene in which there are two love songs. But in fact, uh, all of the story about uh, Julie sitting at the mill, having dreams, having fantasies of something real, what she's fantasizing about is a real love that is different from the love Carrie is going to accept. Carrie is marrying a man. She doesn't totally love him, but she is. Uh, but this is a, 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 the kind of life that she, that a, a, a girl from her background could have. It's going to be a really successful life. It's going to be a, a comfortable life. It's going to give her everything she wants. But it is not what Julie wants. And that's really uh, uh, central to the dynamic of the scene, because you have to understand that Julie is special. And I, I think, do we want to sing the first little bit of Mr. Snow, or do we need sure. not to do that? OK, so can we just go from, from, from his name is Mr. Snow? He 
His name is Mr. Snow, and an upstanding man is he. He comes home every night in his round bottom boat with a net full of heron from the sea. An almost perfect bow, as refined as a girl could wish. But he spends so much time in his round bottom boat that he can't seem to lose the smell of fish. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so that's what that relationship is. He can't seem to lose the smell of fish. He goes out <laughs> herring fishing, and I'm going to marry him. And he's a wonderful guy. He really is. Believe me. Take my word for it. And what we know instinctively, I think, is that that is not what Julie is looking for. Julie has seen something else. It might not be the best thing for her, for her future. Billy Bigelow is, seems a little untrustworthy, and he's going to get to seem a lot more untrustworthy. <laughs> but for her, in 1880, in a rural fishing village in Maine, he's the alternative to, the, to not being able to lose the smell of fish. And I think we, we're on her side automatically. We love Carrie. She's delightful. And we're going to love Mr. Snow when we meet him. He's delightful, too. But they're basically living a life that's not the life that a poet would want. And she is sort of a poet, as we'll find out. So. Um, we, 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 Billy comes back and says, you know, which one of you going to stay? And one of you go home, and the other one of you go home, and the other one of you stay here. And they have this little argument about it. And then finally, Carrie goes home, and they're left alone. And the first thing Billy says to her is, this is 1216, the very top of it. Now we're both out of a job. So even before he gets to say, have you had your supper, they're bonded in some way. They've both lost their jobs because she, he's been told that if she's not back to the mill on time, she's never going to work there again. She has nothing. He has nothing. But there's a bench. <laughs> and now this is where the greed comes in. Run this page of dialogue, <clears throat> page and a half. Have you had your supper? No. You want to eat? Out on the pier? No. Anywhere else? No. You know, you don't, uh, you don't come to the carousel much. Only seen you uh, three times before today. No, I've been there much more than that. All right. Did you see me? Yes. <laughs> Did you know I was Billy Bigelow? They told me. <laughs> Have you got a sweetheart? No. Ah, uh, don't lie to me. I haven't anybody. You stayed here with me the first time I asked you. You know your way around, all right, all right. No, I don't, Mr. Bigelow. And I suppose you don't know why you're sitting here like this with me, alone. You wouldn't have stayed so quick if you hadn't done it before. Uh, what did you stay for, anyway? So you wouldn't be left alone. Alone. God, you're dumb. <laughs> I don't need to be alone. I can have all the girls I want. Don't you know that? I know, Mr. Bigelow. <laughs> what do you know? That all the girls are crazy for you. But that's not why I stayed. I stayed because you've been so good to me. He stood up for her. He stood up for her. And she can't get over that. <clears throat> well, then you can go home. I don't want to go home now. Well, suppose I go and leave you sitting here. Even then, I wouldn't go home. There's this strength of character and strength of will. There's this spine in this girl, and I think that's why we love her, because we really don't learn anything about her, except what she won't do. She won't go home. She won't leave. She won't get married to, in, a, in a conventional way. She won't do anything except look at the thing that she actually wants, which is standing right in front of her. And then. Mill. And you can spend the rest of your life working as a mill girl. Won't that be lovely? And she says, no, I'm, I'll, I'll take the risk. I don't know where it's going to lead, but I'll take the risk. He, uh, Julie says, do I have to go with you? And Bascom says, no, you don't have to. And she says, then I'll stay. 
And then we're in a slightly different place than we were ever in before. Um, and she remembers that Billy was telling her a story, and she tries to get him to start up the story again. But her behavior is so intensely what it is that he's not sure what he's got on his hands here. He's uh, spent his career, we think, seducing girls, taking their money, going from town to town, being hard to catch. And suddenly, he's staying now. And he knows they don't have any money. There's that little exchange about, I've got 43 cents. Don't worry, I'll buy the beer. So he knows that this girl is not a girl he can fleece, because she has nothing to take from him. Um, and what you're seeing, I think, and Richard characterized this so well, actually, when we, when we were rehearsing, is that what's happening can't really be described accurately. You watch the behavior. And what were you saying about Hammerstein well, and that? Hammerstein is uh, the most extraordinary uh, writer in that he was, he was able to define the ineffable uh, force of love that connects people, the thing that can't be expressed in words, can't be expressed in music, but that links people and and he he went beyond dialogue to understand what what uh, what draws people to each other, which is which is beyond logic and and which is the, the the nature of love. I don't know that there's anyone who has been able to so successfully uh, depict that, put that on the stage, as in this scene. Another parallel is the is the. Uh, Twin soliloquies seen in the, the opening scene of uh, South Pacific, where two people fall in love in front of your eyes. Uh, I, he, was a, he was a genius at being able to define that and present it on the stage. And that's what you're actually watching when you talk about the dance of the crested grebe. That's, uh, that's the outward manifestation of something that is ha happening between two beings. And, uh, and that's what you really watch. So. And, and, and now it goes into a sort of a final third act, this scene. Um, and, and I think maybe we should just let them play it and sing it, except every now and then I'm going to shout out something. <laughs> Sorry. So let's, let's pick it up with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Ain't You Scared of Me, right before the music starts. Say, tell me something. Ain't you scared of me? I mean, after what that cop said about me taking money from I ain't scared. What's your name? Julie, Julie something? Julie Jordan. You're a queer one, Julie Jordan. Ain't you sorry that you didn't run away? You can still go if you wanna. I reckon that I care to choose to stay. I wouldn't take my money if I didn't have any And I don't have a penny, it's true And if I did have money, you couldn't take any Cause you'd ask and I'd give it to you You're a queer one, Julie Jordan Ain't you ever had a fella you give money to? No Ain't you ever had a fella at all? No Well, you must have had a fella you went walking with Yes Where'd you walk? Nowhere special, I recall. In the woods? No. On the beach? No. Did you love him? No. <laughs> I never loved no one, I told you that. <laughs> Say, you're a funny kid. You want to go into town and dance, maybe, or? No. I have to be careful. Of what? Of my character. You see, I'm never going to marry. She's never going to be what Carrie is. She's never going to have that relationship. But, does she, but maybe now something she's never seen before in her life is standing in front of her. But she's going to insist that it's not going to be that other thing. I'm never going to marry. If I was going to marry, I wouldn't have to be such a sickler. But I'm never gonna marry, and a girl who don't marry has got to be much more particular. 
Suppose I was to say to you that, uh, that I'd marry you. You? <laughs> that scares you, don't it? You're thinking about what that cop said. No, I ain't. I never paid no mind to what he said. But you wouldn't marry anyone like me, would you? Yes, I would. If I loved you. It wouldn't make no difference what... Even if I died for it. How do you know what you'd do if you loved me? Or how you'd feel or anything? I don't know how I know. Uh. Just the same. I know how... How would it be if I loved you? When I worked in the mill, weaving at the loom, I'd gaze absent-minded at the roof. And half the time the shuttle did tangled in the threads, and the warp would get mixed with the woof. If I loved you. But you don't. No, I don't. It's getting more dubious by the minute whether that's true. But somehow I can see just exactly how I'd be if I loved you. Time and again I would try to say all I'd want you to know If I loved you Words wouldn't come in an easy way Round in circles I'd go I just wanted to say, when we talk about this scene, and we talk about Hammerstein and his brilliance, we also have to talk about Roger's brilliance. The, uh, the drama is in the music as well. When we were rehearsing today, and Greg was just playing through the score, he played through the whole, the whole scene without any words at all. And I was sitting there thinking, my god, the entire scene is spelled out. You utterly know every moment that's happening in it if you just listen to the music. He is dramatizing all the way through it and totally supporting the structure of the scene that Hammerstein ha uh, had, al had already written. So um, it's, it's just important to, to, a lot of times you think of music as being the accompaniment to, to words in some way. Um, but in fact, the storytelling and the drama is in the music. Now, and this is a very perfect point to make this point because look what's just about to happen. Listen to what happens in the music. We started out with three people hollering at each other about whether somebody did something wrong on a carousel, and somebody said, you're, you're, you're yamitzing like a bunch of uh, you know, popcorn on a shovel over a fire. Now watch what happens. We go, this is like the fifth act. So if you start with the it's reprise music from If I Loved You, right? But it's about to change in a dramatic way. So. The song ends, and then, well, anyway. You don't love me. <laughs> That's what you said. Yes. I 
can smell them. And you? The blossoms. The wind brings them down. Boy, that little piece of music. Yeah. Nothing like it anywhere in the scene. It's the transition to poetry, it's the, to, the, to their souls, actually, which is what the next part of the scene is going to be. Right. And, and, and I, this is so much the most beautiful part of the scene, we're just going to make it the worst by talking about it. Um, <laughs> she says, I can smell them, can you? The blossoms, the wind brings them down. And he says, ain't much wind tonight. Hardly any. OK, just hold for one second, and I want to say, the blossoms are coming down. She says, the wind brings them down. He says, there is no wind. And now we're actually sort of in a supernatural world. And Billy Bigelow, who is the most plain spoken, often angry, uneducated, semi-thug, suddenly turns into a poet. And we buy it, sitting in the theater. I think we buy it because we know that there's poetry inside this man somewhere that never actually gets out. The story has a tragic ending. But it's in there someplace. She sees it. He sees it. And, and love the, is going to touch it. Through the courtesy of Mr. Rogers and, and Mr. Hammerstein, he's allowed to express it in this very supernatural moment. Ain't much wind tonight. Hardly any. You can't hear a sound. Not the turn of a leaf. Nor the fall of a wave hidden the sand. The tide's creeping up on the beach like a thief, afraid to be caught stealing the land. On a night like this, I start to wonder what life is all. need you or anyone to help me. I got it figured out for myself. We ain't important. What are we? A couple of specks and nothing. Look at there. There's a hell of a lot of stars in the sky. And the sky is so big the sea looks small. And two little people you and I, we don't count at all. <laughs> You're a funny kid. I don't remember ever meeting a girl like you. you... <sighs> Are you trying to get me to marry you? No. What's putting it in my head? <laughs> You're different, all right. I don't know what it is. You look up at me with that little kid face like you, like you trusted me. And that's what no one has ever done for him. No one has ever trusted him. No one has ever protected her. They're both out of the job. The petals are falling. The sky is full of stars. The beach, the waves are climbing up on the beach trying to steal the sand. And we are really in a completely enchanted land from having started in the most realistic place in the world. And we finish this way. I wonder, what did it be like? What? Nothing. I know what it'd be like. It'd be awful. I can just see myself kind of scrawny and pale. Picking up my food and lovesick like any other guy. I throw away my sweater and dress up like a dude in a dicky and a collar and a tie. If I loved you. But you don't. No, I don't. But somehow I can see. Just exactly how I'd be If I loved you Time and again I would try to say All I'd want you to I loved 
foolish enough to want me to, I, I wouldn't. Don't worry about it, Billy. Who's worried? You were right about there being no wind. The blossoms are just coming down by themselves. It's just their time to, I reckon. I know I'm going to... 